in 1776, in January of 1776, uh, there was an American bestseller written by a guy named Thomas Paine called Common Sense. Uh, Common Sense was a book whose impact on the American story and the revolution is hard to overstate. In fact, uh, John Adams, the second president, um, famously said that without the pen of pain, the sword of Washington would have been wielded in vain. That's a great phrase. Without the pen of pain, the sword of Washington would have been wielded in vain. Uh, common sense did so much to describe our idea and, and hope for self-government and our frustration with uh, the tyranny under which we were operating, and it gave language and direction and focus to a movement that um, just from its printing in January um, took flight that same July. Uh, and so, uh, I'm uh, immensely indebted to the work of Thomas Paine and uh, to Common Sense for uh, its role in my identity as an American. Um, however, um, I think there are some aspects of Thomas Paine's work um, that can sometimes lead us astray. And I think some of his work is more deeply embedded in our American consciousness than we realize. And there's one particular quote uh, from Thomas Paine's Common Sense that I wanted to share with you today because I think it's relevant for our conversation as we're thinking about this topic of political authority. Thomas Paine said, "'Government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, in its worst state, an intolerable one.'" Um, actually, just go one more picture. Uh, people on the internet do funny things, and they take like really dark quotes, and they make beautiful mountain backgrounds behind them. I don't know why. Anyway, um, yeah, government in its best state is but a necessary evil, in its worst state, an intolerable one. This is um, an idea that I think is somewhat embedded in the American psyche. It's even embedded in those um, who are engaged in government. Um, I'm a huge fan of, of John Adams, and so let me quote him one more time. Uh, John Adams famously said that in my many years, I have come to a conclusion that one useless man is a shame, two is a law firm, and three is a Congress, right? <laughs> and, and that's funny because John Adams was a lawyer and his son was a lawyer and a congressman, so I don't know what's happening in their family. But anyway, um, I, I want to suggest uh, that Thomas Paine, at least on this point, was wrong. I want to suggest that rather than government being at best a necessary evil, government at best is a good part of God's plan for human life. And that from the beginning, government is something that God creates. We see it in Genesis chapter 1, where God makes humans and He says, um, go fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it, right? Rule over the earth. I want you to partner with me and I want you to govern the earth. And we see it at the end of the Bible in this passage in Revelation we just read, such an interesting passage, right, where we have uh, the new heavens and the new earth and the resurrection of the dead and death and sin and Satan are gone forever, and yet we still have nations, and we still have kings of those nations who play like an important role in this new heaven and new earth. It's interesting, right? It's not how we tend to think of the new heavens and the new earth, um, but it's, it's part of God's good plan from the beginning and into eternity. Now, um, I want to suggest that government is not a necessary evil, but rather a good that we have often misappropriated and mishandled. And I think uh, that God's plan, um, God's eternal good and eternal reality is that human life should be ordered with structure, um, with some in authority, honoring the greater authority of Christ. The, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about this topic of political authority, and we talked briefly about how um, politics can become a kind of idolatry for us when our political identity is more important to us than our Christian identity. And then we talked about how politics can be a, a source of political division when we categorize and have contempt on people who don't share our views. But today I want to talk about um, the positive component of government. What, what are the hallmarks of God's good government 
that we find in Scripture and that um, might exist in this end-time story uh, in the new heavens and the new earth. So, um, I actually have four ideas um, that I think are components of um, God's good government. And the first one is really simple. The first one is that government is designed to provide for human flourishing, not government flourishing. Uh, Another way of saying that is uh, government should be in service to others and not to itself. We get this so clearly in the book of Deuteronomy. The, The king in Deuteronomy is called to not gather a lot of horses and a lot of wives and a lot of money, right? Horses are military power right? Wives are uh, another kind of power, actually, because as a king, the ability to maintain a dynasty is about having enough descendants, right? And so, um, that's another kind of power. And then, um, obviously, wealth is a kind of power. And instead, Moses says, when you have a king, um, he's going to live amongst the community, right? Like, live as in part of, of, of the people of Israel rather than above them. Uh, and, and that idea of, of, a, of a, a government that's providing for human flourishing, not uh, flourishing itself, not enriching itself, is really central, I think, to this first component of what God's good government looks like. We have plenty of examples of the opposite in our world. Uh, I don't know very much about this, but I read an article this week about, uh, I believe, the governor… Um, no, the, sorry, the mayor of New York City has been indicted for something about taking money from Turkey. Um, I don't really know the whole story, um, but it struck me as um, when I read that article, and this is maybe jaded of me, but I thought, well, yeah, okay, I'm not that surprised. Like, I'm not that surprised that sometimes um, politicians choose to enrich themselves, right? I've read the Bible. I've seen the kings of Scripture do that. Uh, I'm not surprised that people in our day do it as well. Um, But what we really need, I think, is the alternative model. We need people who exercise authority like this king in Deuteronomy is supposed to do. And obviously, I mean, obviously the model for this is Jesus, right? Jesus who has all the authority and all the power, who chooses to live amongst the people, right? He doesn't accrue military power for Himself or financial wealth or a whole bunch of women to adore Him. He he doesn't seek out His own glory, but He glorifies the Father And He lives amongst the people and serves them with His, ultimately, His very life. And I love this idea that um, it is possible, even in this world, even on this earth, even before the new heavens and the new earth come, for us to be um, involved in that kind of government. So, um, I I thought about trying to come up with some real-life illustrations of people, but then I was afraid if I picked a Republican, you'd think I was Republican. If I picked a Democrat, you'd think I was a Democrat. So, I'm going with imaginary people today. Um, And and I have a a, a favorite TV show I've talked about many times called The West Wing. The West Wing was a TV show about a a president and his staff filmed, I don't know, 20 years ago. Uh, And the, the dialogue and the, the way they speak is incredible. Um, but at the heart of this show is this idea that um, people of both parties can actually be working in service to their country and not in just enriching, enriching themselves. And the, the characters in the show are deeply flawed, like they're deeply flawed people. And sometimes they have really bad policies, but they actually care. So, um, this clip I'm going to show you uh, has a character named Ainsley Hayes. Ainsley Hayes. So, the, in the TV show, the president is a Democrat and the, the, the um, people that work for him are mostly Democrats. Um, but there's this woman, Ainsley Hayes, who's a Republican, and she's um, she goes on TV, and she humiliates some of the president's staff, and he thinks that's hilarious, so he um, hires her to work on his staff because um, he thinks she's brilliant, and he likes smart people around him. Uh, and so, she is a lawyer, so she becomes an uh, associate White House counsel, and this is the first meeting she has um, after being hired with, with her new boss, right? And everybody's wondering why this, like, fairly well-known Republican lawyer is now working for this Democrat administration. And I want to play this clip for you. Leo? Mr. Truby. Say they found you an office? Such as it is. Good men and women have worked in whatever room was available in this building and have done so without complaint. I don't believe you heard me complain, Mr. Truby. I believe I did, Miss Hayes. 
Now, why don't you tell me what this is all about? Sir? These people here are trying to do something. I'll have their backs while they're trying. What are you doing here? Serving my country. Why not join the Navy? I was asked to do this. And you said yes? Yes. Why? I feel a sense of duty. I'm sorry. I said I feel a sense of duty. What, did you just walk out of the Pirates of Penzance? Sir? Well, he's an Englishman. He's an Englishman. is from HMS Penafore. It's from Penzance. Don't tell me about Gilbert and Sullivan. It's from Penzance or the Iolanthe, one of the ones about duty. They're all about duty. Then it's from Penafore. Miss Hayes. Is it so hard to believe in this day and age that someone would roll up their sleeves, set aside partisanship, and say, what can I do? <laughs> yes. I want you to go up to the hill this afternoon and I want you to talk to the Associate Majority Council of Governmental Affairs. You're sending me to the Majority Council because I speak Republican? Yes. Two staffers in the communications office, Steve Joyce and Mark Brookline. The two you wanted to kill with your cricket bat for screwing up on possession of the Rockland memo? Yes. Read about it, then fix it. I will. And thank you for asking me. Yeah. Mr. Trivi? I'd like to do well on this, my first assignment. Any advice you could give me that might point me the way of success would be by me appreciated. Well, not speaking in iambic pentameter might be a step in the right direction. Yeah. The president's way too moderate for your taste. Excuse me? On affirmative action, capital gains, public schools, free trade, you left a lucrative practice in Chicago and a seven-figure income. It wasn't out of duty? Uh, I, I love this moment in the show, um, but this is really a show about duty, right? It's about do you have a sense of duty to your nation, duty to your people, duty to your countrymen? And, and I love this idea that um, that's part of God's vision of what good government would be, right? It's, it's, it's a people who say, hey, I'm not here to enrich myself. I'm here to serve the people who sent me. Um, by the way, uh, let me get on a soapbox for 30 seconds and say um, there are two, uh, I, I think, um, visions that are competing ideas on the sort of the extremes of our current political debate. Uh, on the one extreme is uh, the idea of sort of Christian nationalism, and the other idea is what a lot of scholars call civic totalism. And, and, and basically, um, one of those is let's take the government and let's force religion upon people. And one of those is let's take the government and, and force secularism upon people, right? And, and I want to say both of those wildly miss the point if our goal is to do government not um, to dominate the people, but in service to the people. This is part of what made the American initiative so radical and potentially um, so um, connected to the goal of Christ that we wanted to have a government that was of the people, by the people, and for the people. So, uh, as I think about this calling of, of good government, the first thing, um, maybe the, one of the most important things is that it's, it's driven by a sense of duty. It's, it's not about flourishing for itself. It's about empowering people to flourish within its borders. Here's the second thing that's critical about uh, God's plan for good government. Um, really simple. It's about establishing systems of justice and order. Right? Government should provide for human flourishing, not its own flourishing, and government should establish systems of justice and order. Tim Mackey, who's one of the scholars in the Bible Project, um, talks about uh, this idea a little bit. He says, uh, you know, we are a society ordered by law, and we're so much ordered by law that people can place these strange little white signs by the road, and as you drive by those white signs, most people tend to change their behavior based on the numbers written on those signs, right? And he says, imagine if you were an alien and you didn't understand English language or, or American government or whatever, and you saw cars driving past these little white signs, speeding up and slowing down. You'd think there was some kind of like mechanical or technological link between the sign and the car, right? But instead, we just simply have said, hey, um, there is something good about living in a society of order and justice, and we want to be a part of that. 
We're going to read Romans 13 in more detail next week. But in Romans 13, Paul says this, "'Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, excusia, for there is no authority excusia except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you wish to have no fear of the authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive its approval.'" for it is God's agent for your good. But if you do what is wrong, you should be afraid, for the authority does not bear the sword in vain. It is the agent of God to execute wrath on the wrongdoer. That's a fascinating passage given the fact that Paul's talking about the Roman Empire at this time, which is going to be wildly oppressive to Christians and ultimately um, which will have him executed Um, But uh, N.T. Wright in his great book, Jesus and the Powers, says, um, the takeaway here is that almost any government is better than anarchy. God gives government as a gift to humanity to bring welfare, safety, order, and justice to human communities. When the government performs its job well and enables freedom to flourish, perpetuates peace, and administers justice, then we are in right government. Um, Calvin, John Calvin, the theological founder of Presbyterianism, said, The role of government is to, quote, provide for the common safety and peace of all, to preserve the tranquility of the dominion, to restrain the seditious, to help those forcibly oppressed, and to punish evil deeds. All of this explains why the state should be obeyed. Wright says the state is from God and for our good. Now, clearly we are not suggesting that all governments are always good or that all governments do is good, or that governments should be blindly obeyed. We're simply saying that in this larger perspective of what God's good government would look like, justice and order would be a component of that world. And even in a post-resurrection new heavens and new earth where sin and selfishness and evil has been taken away forever, we're still going to need speed limits and traffic signs, right? order is still important for humans to function together. And so, this um, simple idea that good government um, is driven partly by establishing systems of justice and order uh, is an idea we find throughout the Scriptures. Okay, so uh, the first thing that makes for good government is uh, a government that provides for human flourishing, not its own, out of some sense of duty. The second is uh, a system of justice and order. The third is a component I don't know that we think about often, but um, Scripture does, and a lot of our founding fathers did. I think the third function of good government is to cultivate virtue in the people, to cultivate virtue in the people. So, in the beginning of our republic, there was a lot of philosophical and moral debate about whether the idea of self-government was actually good. And the concern was, well, what if you get a bunch of bad people together and they start running things, right? Is it better to have one bad tyrant at the top or a a mob of bad people running a uh, a nation? And in the midst of that, um, so many of our founders spoke directly to this topic and they said the only way that self-government could work is if our people are equipped with virtue. James Madison said… I go on this great Republican principle that the people will have virtue and intelligence to select men of virtue and wisdom. Is there no virtue among us? If there be not, we are in a wretched situation. No theoretical checks, no form of government can render us secure. To suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical and ephemeral idea." Benjamin Franklin said, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. As nations become corrupt and vicious, they have more need of masters. And then my buddy, John Adams, we have no government armed with power, capable of contending with human human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge or gallantry would break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for any other. 
Ah, that's so good. So uh, here's what I love. I, I love this idea um, that um, our, our wonderful experiment of self-government rests on this concept that we need people of moral fiber and character and virtue to be engaged in that work of self-government. And uh, I see in the story of Scripture the opposite happen often. We see, uh, we mentioned him earlier, King Saul, the first king of Israel, who exchanges character and faithfulness to God and morality for political advancement. But Scripture invites us to think of something different. And, and I, I love this part at the end of Revelation where we're told uh, about uh, the, the river of life flowing from the throne of God through the middle of the city. And on either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And I wonder if, if the healing of the nations means um, not that systems, I mean, we do need to see systems be corrected, don't get me wrong, but systems are made up of people, right? And, and the way that ultimately those systems are brought into right alignment is that those people are composed or, or filled or acting upon a virtuous instinct, right? A, a desire to, to not just be right, but to get it right. So, uh, three things I think that are really important for us as we reflect on um, what good government might be in the kingdom of God. Uh, the first is that it's, it's for the people, right? It's for human flourishing. The second is that it creates systems of justice and order. And the third is that it imbues virtue and depends on virtue in its people. Uh, those three are awesome, um, but they, they, they lead to some questions. Government should enable human flourishing, but what causes human flourishing? Who defines what is good for us or not? Um, government should establish justice, but who defines what justice looks like? What is just and what is not? Um, government should inspire virtue, but um, who defines what virtue is and what is the source of virtue? I think this leads us to the, the fourth and final component of what God's good government should look like, uh, and we see this from Gen Genesis to Revelation. We're going to call it generation. We see from Genesis to Revelation, we see that um, all this authority that God imbues and those governing other people and governing His world operates very explicitly under the authority of Christ. And so, we get this beautiful image in Revelation of the kings bringing their splendor into the city of God, right, into the church, and the nations walking by its light we get this idea that those who are reigning are doing so because they are acknowledging that Christ properly and solely is their one king, and everybody else is a subordinate king below Him. N.T. Wright says, God alone is authority. States and their delegates merely have authority. And so, uh, I'm not suggesting that today our job is to create a government that is explicitly Christian. In fact, I just said, um, I think a government forcing religion upon people can be as problematic as a government forcing irreligion upon people. Um, but I think God's ultimate vision is that all authority in heaven and on earth finds its headship in Christ. And I think in those places when we stray most profoundly from that headship, that government um, will ultimately be corrected or challenged or changed um, by the coming of Christ. Uh, I, I want to tell you w one last story. Uh, there's a guy named Wang Yi. Um, Wang Yi was a, is a Chinese intellectual. He was on some lists of like the most influential Chinese intellectuals in the 20th century. I'm sorry, the 21st century. Uh, Wang Yi um, actually visited the White House in 2006 and met with President George W. Bush. And then at some point, um, Wang became a Christian. He converted to Christianity, and then he got involved in a house church, and then he helped grow that house church. Uh, and actually, as a fun, fun side effect, it was a Presbyterian house church, so I like it a lot. Uh, and uh, eventually became appointed as pastor of that house church until 2018. And in 2018, Pastor Wang and a hundred other members of his church were arrested by the Chinese government um, because 
operating a Protestant church that's not authorized by the Chinese government is illegal in that nation. And uh, as he was being interrogated by a police interrogator, Pastor Yi said this, I'm telling you about a power that will last forever, but this power does not demand lands, swords, or all the authority in this day. On the contrary, it is willing to humble itself and submit to the swords and authorities on earth. If you want to use earthly power today to oppress the eternal power, this Scripture has already revealed the end result. History is Christ written large, not President Xi written large. And I think this is um, the calling of Christians in government, right, and under government. Uh, yes, absolutely, we want to say uh, as much as we can on this earth, let's find uh, government that reflects the good government of God. Let's find government that is for human flourishing and not for its own enrichment. Let's find government that establishes systems of justice and order. Let's find government uh, that cultivates virtues in the people. But let's also recognize that, that ultimately kings and presidents and prime ministers, they have authority, but God is authority. And the calling of the Christian life is to say, there will be no authority above Christ in my life. And that if any other authority um, thinks that it is uh, the winner of history, uh, it has something else coming because history is Christ written large. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are reminded today uh, that um, the calling of uh, our people uh, in, in this great American experiment of self-government is to be a people who try to make a government that matches your will and your desire for this world. We recognize that government is a good gift you've given us, um, part of your uh, initial plan and your eternal plan. And we pray, Lord, you'd help us uh, to reflect in this season of, of political debate um, what that good vision for our future looks like. And most of all, we pray you'd help us to trust uh, that ultimately um, all authority in heaven and on earth will find its headship in Christ. And so we have no cause for fear or concern or worry. There's nothing that bad government can do that your kingdom coming cannot undo and make whole again. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage to live out uh, that hope and that promise as the people of the kingdom of God today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.